two, one. Going live. All right. We are live. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it just popped up on YouTube. <laughs> So uh, thank you for making time on this Saturday afternoon to engage with us at Frontline Arts as we listen, um, as we interview the amazing artist Liz Mitchell. And thank you all so much who donated in support of keeping these free programs going so that we can continue to expand our artist interview series. So this is virtual right now, but as a heads up, we are going to have our first limited in-person reception in two weeks for the 10 year anniversary of our Frontline Paper program. And Frontline Paper is just one of our many uh, socially engaged arts programs where veterans make handmade paper out of military uniforms. And we're just really proud that that's been going on for 10 years. So stay tuned. And we also have a number of in-person and virtual uh, hybrid classes that are being released on our website. Uh, we'll have a few more listed each week in the coming weeks. So please go ahead and check that out. So today we are tuning in from a variety of locations from our homes and apartments in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, which are all in the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape tribe also known as Lenape Hulking. I'm Rachel Heberling. I'm the executive director. I am wearing a black shirt and I have my hair in a ponytail and you see the uh, apartment in my background with some artwork on the walls and my door. We have uh, Lindsay Knipe at the controls and she is going to be monitoring the chat today if you have any questions to ask live. Um, and uh, Hugo Gattaca will be assisting us also in the presentation when he gets in. Uh, he's the content editor. Uh, Lindsay's our exhibitions and administrative assistant. And then, of course, we have Liz Mitchell with us, who is the artist we're interviewing today. So let me go ahead and introduce Liz. So Liz is known for her fiber and uh, narrative paper installations. She is a multimedia artist who uses a broad range of materials and processes, including printmaking and collage to tell her visual stories. She uses innovative layering techniques and chooses her materials specifically to create an atmosphere of authenticity around the storyline. The scale of her work ranges from small handmade books to site specific installations. She has exhibited her work both nationally and internationally in group and solo exhibitions for over 25 years. Her work is included in the collections of the Biblioteca Alexandrina in Egypt, the Pennsylvania Power and Light, Johnson & Johnson World Headquarters, Allergan Corporate Art Collection, William Patterson University, the Experimental Printmaking Institute and Skillman Library right here in Easton, Pennsylvania at the Lafayette College, among many others. Liz has also been an incredible longtime member and supporter of Frontline Arts, which is also formerly the Printmaking Center of New Jersey, including serving as our board chair and coordinating our artist residency program. Liz says, I look to nature for a richness of content and surface textures and emulate these characteristics through my varied materials and processes. Within this visual context, I investigate elements of human nature, which move us to ask questions and consider the peculiar and odd themes found in religion, folklore, and fairy tales. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Liz and I will also start the slideshow. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of the series of, of artist interviews that uh, Frontline Arts is, is sponsoring. So thank you so much for thinking of me and having me on today. Of course. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is the introduction to the first piece titled My COVID Challenge. 
So I um, was having trouble, like a lot of people, concentrating as the, the virus really took hold and we were all either quarantined or, um, you know, in restricted movement, staying in our homes. And it was an unsettling time. So I was trying to find something that would really get me down into my studio every day. I was finishing up with the um, Lead Us Not Into Temptation piece, but I wanted something that I could just come into the studio and start to work on that would kind of get me grounded in the studio on a daily basis. So um, I had been using the boat as a metaphor in, uh, in, in my work for quite some time. I had done a sculpture uh, installation piece called The Birds Will Bring Them Home, which included uh, a boat that the birds were sort of tied to and they were carrying, carrying the boat home. And that had been inspired by um, the mass migrations that were starting to take place um, due to climate change and unrest, war, things happening around the world. And we were Every day we were seeing people putting their foot in a boat and trusting it to get them to a better place. So I started to, um, and I had done a whole series of monoprints based on that concept. So um, I created the problem for myself, uh, the problem to solve, which was how to make paper sculpture um, without any internal structure. And um, so my husband, we, I was fighting with it for a while and um, my husband made me this beautiful wooden mold that I could work over. So, um, so that's what I do now. This is, this is one of the boats. And um, I make them in two different kinds of paper. I use a Japanese Kozo paper, which um, makes them translucent. Um, the light shines through them when they're in the water. And then these that are, um, these that are uh, butcher paper, so they're brown paper that has been collaged and then polyurethaned. And you can see some of them here in this picture. This was um, on Pine Island in Florida when I, the first time I actually launched any of them. So, you know, um, how to create something around no structural space. I solved that with the paper mold and then how to get paper to be in water and not just completely dissolve. <clears throat> so we solved that with polyurethane and um, it works pretty well. Um, I've had a few, few that tip and kind of sink, but you know, it's all part of the investigation. So, mm -hmm. so how um, how exactly <coughs> did you do the process of um, putting cast paper over a wooden mold for those who have never done it? Um, well, the wooden mold is, if you can imagine, it's the the positive of the inside. So here's the negative space. the The wooden mold is the positive and. <coughs> You, I just piece by piece um, glue uh, the paper together on top of it, almost like a paper mache. Mm -hmm. I started recently using um, waterproof glue. And um, little by little, it just builds up over time, small piece by small piece. And then it dries on the wooden mold. Of course, the mold is wrapped in um, saran wrap and um, so that it doesn't stick to the mold and then I leave it there to dry so it's it's kind of meditative I tear the paper I glue the paper um, I let it dry that takes time it's kind of a slow slow process but I always have one on the mold and then you know I come down the next day take it off the mold start a new one so um, you know, just kind of, kind of building up the number of boats that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I know you had also mentioned some of the boats sinking um, and finding the uh, 
polyurethane to be a, a big fix with that. But what other what other issues did you have? What do you think was uh, extra difficult about working with these materials in particular? Well, the, one of the reasons I like working with paper is that it's just so it's so so um, it's usable in so many different circumstances. It's pliable. It's immediate. It has different properties, you know, like the the translucency um, and the um, and just the strength. I mean, this is this is like a solid piece of wood now. Mm -hmm. But the thing, the reason that they were sinking, I had to learn that you know you can't build the sides up too high. The bottom has to be flat. Um, I've actually even put sand or river stones in them as sort of a ballast, and that seemed to help. But it's organic and it's different. You know, every body of water that you take them out on is different, so there's gonna be different problems um, under any circumstance, you know, where you, I, I've brought them to a stream that's completely different. You know, you have to, um, you have to hold on to them, so I have the, the string tied to them and, um, you know, and, and there's always going to be something that pops up that day that I wasn't expecting. So um, I found that um, ponds, pools, enclosed bodies of water that don't have, I've, I haven't tried the ocean because it's just, it's too rough. It would, you know, it would drown them right away unless it was like, a tidal pool or something like that. So, yeah. and then I just put them in the water and, um, you know, you'll see in the, in the, um, in the video, they just sort of float and tap into each other. So the thing that I like about it is that the process is meditative. It's a slow process. It's, um, it, you know, it sort of has a, uh, a rhythm to it. And then when they finally do get in the water and I let them respond to the body of water they're in and they just so slowly kind of move into each other because they're polyurethane, there's actually a, a slight tapping noise that they make. Um, you know, the whole process uh, has that sort of meditative quality to it, which, um, which I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, let's, uh, it was in the beginning, you know, I had to kind of fool around with how much, um, how tight I could make them on the mold, how much saran wrap I might need. Um, now when I, when I glue them, I don't put glue on the bottom of the paper. I put the glue on the top. And then as I lay them on the mold, they connect to the next piece of paper, but there's no actual glue underneath sticking to the saran wrap. So it's just, you know, things you learn um, after you make, you know, 20, 20 or 30 of them. <laughs> you know, you, you learn as you go. This was in a little um, man-made body of water in uh, Sarasota and um, there wasn't a lot of movement in the water, but just on the other side in another body of water, there were um, men running their remote control sailboats through slaloms and stuff. So it was, there was a lot of activity going on um, while I was there. This is the Delaware River. Uh, this was just last Saturday and just in a little a, a quiet area off, off of the bridge in Frenchtown. Um, and the next one is in a koi pond uh, down in Naples, Florida. Um, that was just a really small body of water. But, you know, it's nice to see the organic material um, come up around the environment that... Uh, wherever the new new spot is going to be where the boats are released. Great. 
Great. And then this is uh, a video of the boats in action. This was um, last thir uh, week ago, Thursday, uh, at a friend's pond, and there were hundreds and hundreds of koi, and they were actually curious about the boats. They they sort of came up and were poking their heads into the boats. <laughs> That's fantastic. They're very curious, I'm sure, or maybe they thought they were filled with food. Um, they might have. So that leads me to the next question. We'll stay on this slide. Um, is the launching of the boats just as much a part of the art? Uh, like a performance as the boats themselves or the process of the making of boats. Could you speak to that? Yeah, the whole plan um, when I started to make them was that, um, and I was calling it my COVID project because the plan was uh, <clears throat> that I would make them until the virus uh, died down and we could all be together again with the idea that, um, you know, I would bring together a group of people that was interested in seeing the launch and, um, you know, we would we would get together and maybe people would help put the boats in the water and um, see what happened organically, but that it was going to be some kind of a celebration um, that the virus, you know, had died down enough that we could all be together. Um, things have picked up again. Um, so I'll just, I'll just keep making my boats. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. It's all very organic, you know, it, Yeah. they, they taught people, artists talk about site specific. This is very specific to whatever body of water, um, I'm working with. Mm -hmm. So. And you, I, you had also mentioned uh, other inspirations uh, like migration and immigration and, and birds even for this project. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah, well, this, this all started back when I was doing the, the monoprints in response to, um, in response to the, um, the increase in migrants that were moving um, across the the Mediterranean into um, the island of Lesbos. And mm -hmm. um, we were all seeing that every day in the news. And so my question became, and I was also, I'm a new, relatively new kayaker. And so I, you know, you've heard of this, the saying, no river twice. The water, the body of water is never the same as it was the last time you, you, went into the water. So you never know necessarily what you're, what you might run into. And, and what is it that, um, what is the motivation that trusts you to put your foot in the craft and that the craft is going to carry you to where you want to be? Because if you remember some of these, um, boats were, were just small blown up dinghies with motors on them. And mm -hmm. so, um, you can imagine the motivation there, but what is, you know, just as a consideration, what is it that allows us to take the leap of faith to get into the boat and to travel? And so um, I've, I've been looking at this as a, um, as a question for a number of years, and, uh, and that's where the original idea came from. Mm -hmm. In the installation that I did, the birds will bring them home. The idea is that um, as you approach the shore, that's, you know you're approaching the shore when you start to see the seabirds. Mm -hmm. And so that particular piece was very specific to, to migration and to the hope of being able to actually get to the next shoreline that you're going to. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's where that, that whole idea came from. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. And there's certainly a, a, a sense of fragility and, and impermanence and uh, a fleeting time as well in this piece, for sure. Yeah, these, these, these are definitely impermanent. Um, 
there are times when they've been in the water and I, I bag them up to bring them home and I get, and I look at them the next day and they're, you know, they become distorted. You know, they start to, they get a little bit of moisture deep inside them and they start to distort a little bit. So I have no idea how long these will last, but hopefully they'll last enough that we can do a nice, nice big launch. <laughs> that would be amazing. Well, thank you. Let's um, let's move on to the next uh, the next slide. I think there is one image uh, after the title with that slide, and this is the butterfly kimono piece. If you'd like to talk about it. So when the the virus was starting to get um, inc was starting to increase the number of people getting sick um, around the beginning of March. Uh, I had been invited months prior to um, St. Leonard du Nobla to the Moulin de Go um, paper mill to be in a show called Influences Nippone, which is uh, Japanese influence. And so all of the work in the, um, in the exhibition um, was related to some uh, form of a uh, Eastern, um, Eastern influence. So, um, this is a piece that I made. It's evolved. Um, I made it, um, a while ago and, um, I was, I had gone to a used bookstore. Actually, it was a used bookstore in Easton. And I found a small book of French fairy tales. And in the, um, story that I was reading, there was a point of transformation in the story where the, um, in this case, it was a fairy in the story was coming into the situation to do a major transformation, wearing a cloak of butterfly wings. And it was such a strong visual um, spark for me. Um, and I, I just started working on this piece right away. And I chose the kimono shape because it is a very, it's, it's as if you were trying to take the idea of a cloak down to its simplest form. The arms, the body, the T shape, um, you can look at it from across the room and get a feel for what, it's, what, it's, what the form is supposed to be. The cloak is open. It's not restricted. Um, it's joyful. Um, and that's what I was, um, that was what I was hoping to accomplish. So the, um, the butterflies themselves are relief printed. They're lino cut, um, relief printed on Japanese paper, Kozo paper. Um, each one is hand cut. The first year that I made it, I brought a sheet of them to my family's house for Easter and everyone joined in and helped me cut out the butterflies. Um, I, when I arrived in France, uh, this is an operational paper mill. Um, I took some of the paper from the paper mill and I had brought some of my small lino cuts with me and we stamped out more butterflies that could be added to the piece as a way to incorporate the history of this amazing medieval paper mill. Um, they still have the original stone and wood beaters in the, in the basement and the mill race that runs alongside that used to operate the, the hammers that would pound the, the paper. Um, so we arrived on March 9th in Paris. We took the train down to Limoges and drove out to St. Leonard and then um, installed the work uh, in a couple of days. Um, this is my husband and I that went. And um, Friday night was the opening. It was March 13th, which is my birthday. And um, they had the opening in person. Um, we had a wonderful meal together and um, 
spent time together and that was the 13th the 14th we changed our flights to the 15th and we turned around and came home we were supposed to be there another week and the um paper mill and the paper mill actually closed down and they had to take the time to figure out how they were going to do smaller tours during covid having control over people coming into the space and they've done that off and on they've actually had to close a couple of times um to get reorganized but um the the setting was extraordinary they have um an exhibition crew that came through and literally made the um upstairs of the paper mill where they usually hang the paper to dry they turned it into like it looked like a street in kyoto it was if you see all this white cardboard that's produced by a local company and they um they actually put up wooden studs and attach the cardboard to it so structurally it was a very sound and little um little vignettes of other people's work it was real they did a fabulous job so um so that's what this piece is about what they ended up doing was extending the show by a year because they had taken so much time to do this staging and they weren't able to show it to as many people as they would have liked to so um they decided to keep the work uh for another year so it's there until december so i'd love to go back and pick it up but i'm not sure that'll happen Oh my gosh. Yeah, I actually um this pandemic has been such a blur, but I do remember uh sharing this in our newsletter at that point and trying to follow you and I was I was really worried. <laughs> um you know because I think we had shut down basically on the evening of March 12th and I remember seeing that you were in Europe and I'm just like, "Oh my goodness." <laughs> well, I I kept saying to to Tom Maybe we could just stay here and and wait it out, you know. Oh my god. Being naive about how how bad it was going to get. Yeah. But yeah. no, we came home, you know, they were talking about closing the borders and, you know, we just didn't want to get caught up in anything and get stuck somewhere. So anyway, we we did come home and um you know, they've been very gracious uh and and I I would love to call them good friends now because they um it was a wonderful experience yeah and what what a dream to get to see uh such an original studio like that that i i'd love to see it it's a um it's a fabulous space it's yeah so um would you like to speak any more about the significance of the butterflies or the specifics to the uh kimono garment the traditional japanese garment itself or japanese fairy tales well um as as a little girl my mother used to um read japanese fairy tales and poems to us and um so i i had an early influence on the aesthetic of of um japanese tales and illustrations and things and a lot of times in in as i got older and i was reading um uh reading more japanese tales of um not quite fairy tales kind of short stories but there was always a reason to keep your kimono tightly wrapped around you whether it was it was cold the wind was blowing um sometimes you were hiding something under your kimono um it could have been a hairy wart you know it could have been you know something that you were hiding and um and there's such tradition in how to close the robe and things mm -hmm. like that but but that wasn't really the direction I was going in because um uh you know those are those are cultural implications of the kimono and this kimono is open and um uh in flight and um to me has some references to kites and things like that so uh, aesthetically it's the the japanese um 
it's a, a you know it's a cultural icon. Um, but for me, um, I took my own twists and turns um, and developed it according to my relationship with um, with with the aesthetic and um, and wanted to create something really joyful. Uh, and as I said before, the the structure um, was really important to me that it was just simple lines and um, and you know, visually right away, you could determine in your head, this is, this is a cloak, this is a kimono, this is, um, and, and, and it, it also draws back to um, human scale. A lot, you know, I do installations, I make artist books, but it's all based on human scale. So this is four feet by four feet. Um, it's human scale. Um, even though the atmosphere around it is making it, you know, into a larger installation, I wanted it to have some kind of human connection to to the body. So that's why that's why I chose the shape. That's why I chose the size. Um, there's about four or five different uh, types of butterflies on this purely fantastical. They're not related to um, any biological um, characteristics uh, other than their two wings, you know. Um, but yeah, and very humble material. This is um, a cotton gauze, um, thousands of butterflies. I'm always asked, how many? Thousands. I don't really count them, but there are thousands of them on there because yeah. they're inside and outside. So, yeah, that's a really intense installation process. I, I feel lucky. I remember I got to see one uh, on the stairway outside the Skillman Library at Lafayette a few years ago, and it was it was an all encompassing experience as you descended down the stairs. Uh, that no, that no, particular no, installation yeah. was the the kimono was dropped down like a marionette mm -hmm. from above. And so we had to figure all of that out. Mm -hmm. I think there were five of us installing it. And um, yeah, everywhere you go, it's different. The installation is different. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, let's, let's move on to the next slide which is actually a currently installed piece at the Hunterdon Art Museum called Lead Us Not Into Temptation. Yeah, so this, this piece um, was a long time coming. Um, I conceived of it um, uh, a number of years ago uh, and then did quite a bit of research. So the basic, um, concept is it, it's my response to uh, the child sexual abuse within the Catholic Church. Um, there's a lot of um, my own um, my own sort of personal um, reference to my experience in the Catholic Church. Not that this this was something that happened to me, but this was something that I felt um, very strongly about because um, uh, you know, I just felt that that was the worst, you know, one of the worst offenses of, to a child is to destroy their trust and, and to be exploited in this way. So I, um, started to look at it as, um, uh, the, the, uh, what the clergy wear, the, the Cossacks that they wear, um, the idea of um, the hair shirt, which is uh, something that that was worn not just in the Catholic faith, but in um, in other religions, it was a um, a shirt that was worn with hair on the inside, and it caused discomfort. And it was a sign of piety. It was a sign of dedication, and it was a sign of um, contrition for sins committed. And um, they would wear them under their, their um, traditional uh, Cossacks and 
um, priest robes and things um, so that it would be there, but, but not obvious and then causing them discomfort that would keep, keep their um, vows in their, in, you know, in mind. So I went with the idea of that kind of a shape of a garment. These are Japanese Kozo paper, paper, uh, Kozo paper garments that are hand sewn uh, from patterns. And then they're uh, printed, relief printed with horsehair, and then um, coated with encaustic wax, which gives them structure and then hand threaded and sewn with horsehair. In this case, the horsehair is sewn to the outside of the shirts, which is, um, uh, it's hypocritical to the original intent. So the hair on the outside is for show and it's not for the, um, for the original intent. And to me, that was the, the twist Mm -hmm. uh, in the creation of the piece that the hair is worn on the outside, that it's just for show. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, um, the shirts hang from stanchions. I chose these stanchions because they were very solid. Um, not quite like hanging gallows, but they had, they had a sense of uh, strength to them and they grounded the pieces. There's three because within the Catholic Church there's the Trinity. Um, it's an important element of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and I followed with that tradition uh, in creating three of these shirts that hang together. They, um, if you go back to the picture from the Hunterdon Art Museum you can see the stanchions and you can see the um, the salt that rings around the bottom of the um, of the work. Um, the salt represents purification. It's for protection. Salt is used in a number of um, Catholic rituals, um, baptism, uh, holy water, um, uh, exorcism mm -hmm. uh, and um, and extreme unction, which is the final rites. So salt is a um, element that's used in a lot of different rituals. Um, so you can see the ring around the base is salt. And it also, for me, helped ground the piece and contain it, but also as a... Um, as a as a way of dealing with an un, uncontrollable situation for me to provide some kind of safety and protection within this um, difficult conversation mm -hmm. so um, that was that was my intention with that mm -hmm. yeah those are just incredible metaphors i think for for reversing the hair from or the discomfort from the inside of the garment to the outside right which would also is projecting the discomfort onto others instead yeah of it's um, I, I was yeah i was in a um, conversation in a podcast um and the the person that was interviewing me said isn't it isn't it wonderful that these things are now coming out that we can have conversations about them and find a way that they don't have to happen anymore. And that's my greatest hope that by talking about it and um, uh, finding a way to um, represent this in my own way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and also the, the circle of sort of a, a reverse uh, ring of protection for, for those uh, just talking about this finally and and for the viewers since it is such a difficult subject uh, i really love that as well um can you describe the process at all of actually making these pieces it's uh you you relief printed hair 
um, onto the the paper and how you also exactly how did you sew horse hair onto these garments? Um, the uh, the printing I just sort of um, literally inked horse hair mm -hmm. and um, dampened the uh, paper. It was an oil based ink and I dampened the paper and laid it over the, the horse hair and printed it that way. Um, the uh, patterns of the fabric, the shirt patterns were hand sewn together. And I um, used a um, Japanese root starch to treat the paper, Koniaku, um, is a uh, root powder that you can um, soak the paper in and it brings strength to the paper. That was really helpful, um, you know, because you're sewing them and turning things inside out and, you know, they need a little bit of, of strength. Um, and, and like I said, it was a very long process. I did a tremendous amount of research on uh, the victims, the stories, um, and in that respect too, it was something I would at times have to put down for a while and, mm -hmm. and go work on something else. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's why I'm appreciative that the boats are so joyful. I can <laughs> move from finishing this piece into this next um, range of work, which is more joyful. Um, the hair is sewn three horse hairs threaded through a, uh, a needle, kind of a large needle that I use in making my books. Um, it's sewn through and then it's knotted. And then everywhere that it's knotted, um, the horse hair splays out from that. And it gives a, a kind of a fullness um, that was, was nice and it was unexpected. Um, also, the other thing that happened is that once the once they were waxed and threaded with the hair, they took on a skin-like quality, mm -hmm. which was um, uh, an interesting, um, an interesting thing that happened that I wasn't necessarily expecting, mm -hmm. and that fit into the range of the story. Um, yeah, I think that's what makes it just—it's—it's uh, it's intrinsically unsettling. And it has a um, a beautiful grotesqueness. Yes. <clears throat> Someone had asked one of the questions was, um, where do you buy horse hair? <laughs> I was just about to ask that. Yes. What are your sources? On the internet, you can just uh -huh. Google horse hair and they come in these beautiful skeins, kind of like Lindsay's braid. <laughs> you know, they come in these beautiful long skeins with uh, white cording knotted along the way. You can buy them in all different colors. Um, uh, some of them are a blend of two different colored hairs. Um, and you can buy them, you know, in the longest length possible. Um, horse hair is used for um, different kinds of things. Um, tassels for saddles and um, decorative items. So um, there's a market for it. So it's out there and, uh, and it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful material to work with. Uh, I had friends that had horses that offered horse hair to me, but I, I wanted to go with something that was really clean and had already been sort of sorted, you know, um, Horse hair to be to use horse hair for anything where it needs to bend um, it has to be taken from a horse that's alive. Um, if if a horse is deceased, the hair immediately becomes brittle. Mm -hmm. So um, I figured I'd leave it up to the experts and and um, let them sort it out and and then uh, just order it from them. So that's what I did. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, so speaking of horse hair, uh, I also wanted to talk about some of your artistic influences. And 
maybe it was just me, but one of the things I thought of right away was was Anne Hamilton's Tropos, where there were floors completely covered with horse hair, um, with a performance in the center of burning pages out of a book. And I also thought about her really early toothpick suit with the sort of uncomfortableness of the, the sensation. Um, I know she works a lot with, with fabric and textiles as well. Um, or even the more recent stylus with cast paper hands. So I sort of thought of some of her work right away, but I know that you also have other stronger artistic influences that that you may want to mention. I, um, I've always appreciated the work of Kiki Smith and, and mm -hmm. one of her first lithographs was um, uh, a piece that she had done of printing her own hair. And mm -hmm. if you know Kiki Smith, she has that wonderful, wonderful hair. And uh, I, liked, I liked looking at that um, work because it, it relates to uh, to the body and in a in a similar sense I try to scale the work to to the to human scale um, so I would say that might have influenced me more um, for me what I try to do when I'm working on a concept is I try to think of what materials um, what materials I need to use to bring the most most authenticity to the storyline, mm -hmm. and and that that can be um, a, sort of a situation where I have to, I might have to learn how to work with a whole new medium if I'm going to bring that uh, if I'm going to stay committed to that authenticity within the story. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really looking at a lot of um, other artwork when I was doing this, but um, uh, I would say that Kiki Smith's hair prints um, had had a strong, you know, effect. Uh, they were an inspiration to me. I think the the other um, the Tropos piece. Um, I liked I liked looking at that because um, I liked the idea of her. Uh, having you enter this room where hair is just so thick on the floor that it it slows you down and 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 there's a table sitting in the middle of the floor um, that you're walking towards so now you're making sort of she includes a lot of sound with her work so now you're making a noise with your feet and you're you're smelling the burning of the paper and you're seeing the burning of the paper and the table with the individual is sort of standing out uh, from this topography that you have to make your way through to get to. And you're not quite sure what's going on or what that burning smell is, or I like the mystery of it. Um, and there are lots of people now working with hair, um, uh, working with synthetic hair too. Um, uh, so, and those, those pieces are sort of about the material, you know, if they're, uh, you know, hair flowing from a window gives you the, you know, the thoughts of Rapunzel and that kind of thing. Those pieces become about hair. This piece um, has hair as, so I see those as sort of the, the, the broad story, maybe the preface of the story. Mm -hmm. Whereas mine, I feel like is the full sentence. It tells you what the, what the material is, what the objects are, what it relates to. Um, so it's, um, it's just two different ways of working. Of course. But all, all encompassing, you know, as far as all the senses. I would assume yeah. that this piece may even have a bit of an odor. I don't know. It, we it, well, it, it doesn't. The intention was with the wax to give it that sort of um, uh, candle wax smell. Oh. Um, but uh, that does dissipate after a while. Yeah. So. Fascinating. Uh, we had one other question that I thought related to what we're talking about right now, and it was about exactly how you arranged the salt 
on the floor and they wondered if it was affixed firmly to the floor with glue. Uh, no. And whenever I have installed and, you know, I've only installed this within my own working space. Um, I don't have, you can see there's a black material underneath it. That was done um, at, you know, as, at, at the request to protect the floors. So that was a problem we had to solve. You know, that was became one of the particular site um, requirements. So um, none of it's glued down. In fact, I came in one day and uh, there was almost like a footprint in the salt because and the salt had been moved off the the material. Um, so it's very organic. I mean, it's going to move. It's going to uh, vibrate. It's, you know. Mm -hmm. So no, the glue isn't, the, the salt isn't glued down. Although I did look into um, what kind of glue you would need to use if you wanted to glue down salt. So they do make a specific glue for that, so. Wow. <laughs> so you have to learn all of these things you never thought you'd need to know. <laughs> no, and, and it's fascinating, it's fascinating. <laughs> so let's, let's move to the last title and slide before we get to some of the audience questions. I know we're coming up on four o'clock soon, but we also have uh, the monotype image of your boats. So these, these were done for um, a solo show I had at the Wachung Museum of Art in um, 2016. This is a um, uh, that whole concept of, of trusting the craft and what it means to um, uh, put your foot in the boat, to take the chance, to take the risk. Maybe it's stormy, maybe there's um, there have been boats there before you. Um, but this was the inspiration um, of the, the, the latest boats. It's the continuation of of the whole trusting the craft kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so. I, I remember, I know you were working on this before, but I also remember you were in a workshop with Ron Picasso um, working on some of these monotypes, if I'm yep. correct. Yes. Did you, mm -hmm. did you have any uh, moments during that experience that you, you felt a move to the project in, in any direction or just the way that you were thinking about the monotype process? Well, it's interesting. The one on the right was the first in the series and the one on the left is the last in the series. Mm -hmm. um, was there any... Did it change your image making process at all? Well, I think you can see it in the two of these mm -hmm. going from uh, the actual enclosed form to the skeleton form. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, uh, you know, I started doing stenciling and, um, uh, the, and mapping, more mapping, I think with Ron, mm -hmm. he, um, he has a great way of working where you actually are mapping out parts of your images and, um, using um, transparency sheets to, to do that kind of mapping so that you can go back into it multiple times and add uh, more information to, um, you know, add color to, to do different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I would say that I, I moved the project along in that, um, in the class where he was assisting us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely beautiful. And of course, I always like to see how, um, you know, printmaking relates. I just think it's such a fun way to, you know, go back and forth with with other art media, um, even if it's just painting or uh, sculpture or performance. It just I feel like it forces you to always go back and literally think about it backwards and by steps and by layers. And so I love that that kind yeah. of dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> materials and process are Im important um, to what I end up doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you try not to create such a big problem that you don't get the work done. 
but um, I, I like being challenged to solve solve the problems that come up. So, oh, we have a question about this piece in particular. Um, Carolyn Spivak wants to know, she says, the image on the left has more of a sinking feel. And if that was your intention. Um, it ended up being that, yeah. Yeah, that's good of you to, to notice that. Yeah, um, one of the original uh, inspirations for these pieces was a, a painting that was done, I think his name was Patrick Kelly. He's an Irish painter. And he was doing a, um, a piece that was related to the, the Sea of Galilee and the loaves and fishes parable um, where Christ shows up. There's a storm coming in and all the men, the fishermen on the boat are scared. And the Christ figure shows up and says, um, follow me back to the shore. You can walk on water. Mm -hmm. and, and the men were distrustful and said, you can't walk on water. And so it was that, um, it was a, a question of faith, you know, at that point. Mm -hmm. So I, um, uh, in response to that, I did a kayak instead of a fishing boat and, um, and the figure sort of floating, you know, kind of walking on the water. Uh, and sometimes inspirations are the jump off point you know, and then the work can progress uh, to other things. So um, that's, that's kind of where, where that all came from. Great. So I think, I think we can stop the slideshow presentation. And then I will just ask a few more general questions that came from some of the pre submitted questions from our audience. And one of them was from Akua Leslie Hope, who asked about your, your paper making experience. Uh, like how long have you been paper making or have you and, and what led you to using that material? Um, paper is really immediate. I started as a ceramic artist and anyone who's worked in ceramics knows um, that's not an immediate craft. It's um, there's a lot of things that can happen from point A to point B when when you glaze a pot and you know there's a certain amount of time that it transpires between making the pot and having it glazed and but I like the immediacy of working with paper. I am not a um, big paper maker. I mean I don't do it all the time. I've made paper uh, with Walt Nygaard at Frontline Arts. Um, made paper. Uh, from World War II uniforms for another project that I'm doing. Um, and I do paper make in my studio, but the paper that I use, I buy it on rolls. And, um, and that comes from, it comes from a supplier in California, mm -hmm. but I am starting to think about making my own paper. So um, I'd like to, to experience making Abaca. So Yes, yes, we, we have certainly uh, used that fiber at the studio. And I, I know you were in for uh, an experience with uh, our main veteran papermaker, Walt Nygaard, uh, in making some from a, a World War II uniform. Gosh, yep. I guess right before COVID? <laughs> right before, like a minute and a half before, before COVID. And um, the thing that I'm interested in... Um, uh, working, I, I'd like to work with longer fibers. So I want to, yeah. you know, I'm going to start looking at what that means. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. And different plant fibers for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, some other general questions were, gosh, um, if you were going to do any more work and this is from Lisa Matheson, with uh, any other issues with the Catholic Church and like financial or political, and, and if you have gotten any backlash about the project at all? Um, no, I haven't gotten any backlash. Um, I don't think anyone would deny that, 
that this issue happened, yeah. you know, so I don't, I don't know, um, you know, I don't know what the backlash would be except for telling the truth, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm working on a project now. Um, my aunt was a missionary in China during World War II, and I've been working on that project for a long time, and that's what I was making the paper with Walt for. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of it's not uh, based on the Catholic religion, but it's, it's, that's part of the context of, of the story. Mm -hmm. So... Um, no, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna work on my joyful boats for a while, <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Oh. Well, you always have to have a variety of work to go back and forth with. I I completely understand, uh, but it's really an incredible and powerful piece, and Thank you. I'm very excited to see where the project goes uh, with your aunt and her missionary experience. So if anyone has any other questions, I believe we covered all of them. Unless I missed something, Lindsay, let me know. And, um, and Liz, if you have anything else that you would like to say to our viewers. Well, no, just thank you, you know, for taking the after time off this afternoon to to listen to me talk about my work. Um, the work is up at the Hunterdon Art Museum through January 6th. Um, and, uh, you know, you're welcome to come down and see it. It's a, it's a beautiful member show, um, a lot of really good work. And some of our other members are in it, um, Pat Cudd and Pat Swe Sweeney Morrell. And um, I think I might be missing someone but, um, you know, there's, there's some really good work in the show. Um, and yeah, and the piece will be up till January 6th. So. Great, so everybody has plenty of time to go see it. Uh, Lindsay, if you would like to link that show in the YouTube chat and then everybody can go find it. I think I, I'm ashamed. I have not seen it in person yet, but I'm really excited to and, it's an incredible uh, historic venue in Clinton, New Jersey, which is not too far from Frontline, about 20 minutes. So yeah, I was I was happy to uh, to have the piece settle in where it's where it ended up being shown because it has those big wonderful beams behind it, and yeah. um, it just it was a nice setting for it. So yeah, absolutely. and it's a wonderful little town. It's you know beautiful little historic town. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I'd, uh, I'd like to wrap up as promised to let everyone continue with their, their evenings tonight. And hopefully you're, you're doing something fun on a Saturday evening. But we, we really appreciate you uh, coming to this artist talk with us virtually today. Uh, so if you'd like uh, any more information, we have, yeah, Lindsay just put the Hunter and Art Museum link. We can put Liz Mitchell's uh, artist website link in there as well. And of course, you can always go to frontlinearts.org for any more information on what we do as an organization. So thank you all. Thank you, Liz. And thank thanks you for having me. Putting this on, Lindsay and Hugo. We really appreciate it. Thanks for all your help. Great.